Okay, thank you so much for joining the session. Really looking forward to talking with you about um, our insights from the X-Force Red perspective on, on what we call long tail detection response. And uh, this is a topic that you know, comes up a lot because we, we all uh, in this industry are running vulnerability management programs and we're trying to figure out ways to deal with some of these more problematic vulnerabilities that show up in our vulnerability management programs. And um, uh, this is really geared towards uh, practitioners and executives who've been frustrated by this type of uh, this this type of problem, you know, really getting ourselves uh, moving on our remediation management programs. Just a couple uh, quick notes about our team. I'm glad to be a, a guest today and speaking with you as part of the uh, this year's QSC. Um, I work with a team called X Force Red, and we're an autonomous team within IBM of hackers, penetration testers, offensive security experts, and our goal is really to work with our teams, with, work with our clients to actually give you a sense of where the vulnerabilities are that an attacker would take advantage of. And so when we're doing that work within IBM, we're really looking at it from the perspective of, of, of would, you know, any of the vulnerabilities that are coming up with your Qualys scans, would an attacker take advantage of that? Would an attacker look at that? And that's our, really our goal. And we bring a lot of um, you know, great, great skills and experience to bear industry veterans that, that help us to do that. We also, of course, do uh, penetration testing and adversary simulation. Myself, my name is Steve, uh, Steve Osepic. I'm the CTO of, of this X-Force Red team. Um, I've been in the industry for about 20 years, uh, quite a while now. I'm an uh, entrepreneur, I've started companies. I was a, a pioneer in something called network access control uh, way back in the, in the day. And um, uh, my job is to create new services, work with our technology vendors, um, produce you know intellectual property patents and such. That's a picture of me last year keynoting the QSC. So have a great uh, relationship with Qualys and uh, really glad to be talking to you again. So as I said before, we do penetration testing, we do adversary simulation, and of course we do vulnerability management, which is a big part of what I'll talk to you about today. But uh, we see these as all being really... Um, part of the same spectrum of, of finding vulnerabilities and, rem, and remediating them and, ha, and helping to focus on the right ones. And I will say it's a little bit unusual to find vulnerability management within um, uh, the red team or the offensive security team, but we find that it's very, very valid to have it within, within our group because if you, can, if you think about it, you can look at us as kind of the connoisseurs of vulnerabilities from an attack perspective. We look at them because we utilize them to get into systems and we have very strong opinions about which ones specifically you should, you should remediate first. And so that, that brings us into a, a real good relationship with, with Qualys and, and, and why we've been so impactful in working together with Qualys to, to, to remediate vulnerabilities for our clients. Um, the average is no, no surprise, probably for a lot of you, that, that these are huge numbers that we're dealing with in terms of vulnerabilities that your, that your scanners are finding within the environment. Um, we have a lot of traditional kind of concerns that persist within our traditional IT environments. And I'll touch a little bit on IoT today because that's another piece of the puzzle that we're seeing a lot. But um, 1.7 million vulnerabilities is an average we've seen as high as eight to 11 million, this, would, this number represents a vulnerability that is uh, found by the scanner plus a system. So the intersection of a, of a vulnerability, a system, and, um, and of course, system owner. So these are, this essentially paints a picture that, frankly, we're, not, we're struggling a lot in, in this industry to really remediate vulnerabilities. And we know that, and we're constantly looking at ways to, to do better, to, to optimize this process and do a better job. And, um, as part of that, we find that of all of those vulnerabilities we find that, that, that Qualys reports to us that, you know, that our clients are finding, we find that only about 16% of those have associated public exploitation, which means these are vulnerabilities that have been weaponized, that are being used by attackers. And that's a big part of our strategy and, and, and what I was speaking about before in terms of our penetration testing roots and, and, and our offensive security mindset is that we really look at vulnerabilities through the perspective of whether or not an attacker is going to be targeting that. Um, so as you know, there are several steps roughly in any remediation management or vulnerability management program. And if you, we've talked a lot, in, I think last year as well, about prior years about discovery, about prioritization, 
this year, because of the VMDR theme, we're really going to be focusing a lot on remediation itself, right? What are the challenges there? We've spent a lot of time talking about those other ones, but but we haven't really gotten into remediation. And I think you know VMDR represents uh, you know Qualys's commitment to trying to to to, to make, give us better tools in order to do remediation. And X Force Red has always been about taking advantage of that. Of, of, of whatever data we can get and really driving remediation better. So this is a, this is a great opportunity here. Um, we really do need innovation in this specific space in terms of remediation. We know there's no shortage of vulnerabilities. We know that um, the discovery capabilities within our systems is getting better. Um, and, and, and we know that these devices, these, um, you know, Qualys is finding a lot of devices and fingerprinting them. Um, the CMDB, if you know, if you're familiar um, with, with asset inventories or other systems like Remedy and ServiceNow, you see them as really what we're seeing in the industry is these things are becoming much more of almost like a system of record of everything we know, not just manual data entry, but also kind of a holding place for data that the scanner is picking up. Um, you need that real world observable data. We need the, the, the Qualys data feeding in and giving us the, the, real, the reality of our environment, not just uh, that we're gonna somehow manually keep up with this massive amount of data that, that uh, we, we have to manage in terms of the inventory of these, of these environments. And you start adding in now, you know, some of the BYOD use cases, you start adding in devices that come from home, and uh, people bringing their own devices. And of course, in this new world of remote work, it, it gets very problematic and cumbersome. But when you can put an agent, like a Qualys agent on a system and then have it feed into the CMDB, we have that now real time capability. So this is, you know, this is, this is where there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good work being done in terms of discovery. And the discovery piece alone, I'll speak about this in VMDR a little bit as well. It has its own value. We, we tend to focus a lot uh, when we do vulnerability management on, on vulnerabilities, the actual uh, findings that come out that say which things are, are problematic from a security perspective. But we don't talk enough about just the, the inherent capability of a, of a device uh, or of a scanner finding devices and, and fingerprinting them. And that actually is coming around a lot in IoT. So there's a lot of great technology there in discovery. Prioritization has a lot of great technology. We've talked about this in years past, and and Qualys has the threat protection. Um, Kenna is is another player in this space. Um, Risk Vision, um, uh, X Force Red vulnerability ranking. Of course, I'd encourage you to use that and look into that. There are many ways. Maybe your own industry feeds, right? Um, some of the uh, ISACs, uh, if you will, that provide some data around which vulnerabilities are being targeted by attackers. There's lots of great data here. What I encourage you to do is look for those strategies when you're using that to, con to have good contrast. And what I mean by that is have, you know, utilize strategies that allow you to really separate the things that you should be focusing on from the things that you maybe are not, uh, that, that you want to put on the back burner. And we're gonna talk a lot about focus today because it's a key component of remediation management. But um, this is, this, these are areas, both of these represent things that we may have talked about in years past, we're really gonna focus in on remediation. And of course, the big part of remediation is, um, if, you, if you know what I'm referencing here, a, a famous Starfleet captain liked to say, make it so. Sorry for the, the Star Trek reference, I can't help myself. <laughs> but it is absolutely that time where you, you have your vulnerabilities discovered, you have your devices discovered, you have your prioritization list, and you know what you need to focus on. The area that VMDR helps with a lot, and X-Force Red works, you know, is, 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 is excited to use this capability with our clients is, is in that piece of actually remediating the vulnerability. So it's a lot harder than it looks, unfortunately, as a lot of us have found the hard way. Um, and when you, when you start really looking at which ones do, you know, how do I actually drive change? How do I drive uh, remediation? And so, so we'll talk through a couple of these and really look at how, you know, how we need to, 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 to focus on each of these different areas. Um, we'll break them up into different ones. One is we're going to talk about business constraints. Uh, there's, there's one for, for lack of a better word, the patch, it doesn't patch, if you will. Um, uh, false positives that, of course, are always something that we have to keep an eye on. Um, third-party vulnerabilities and, and some of the things around ownership. 
So business constraints. Um, if uh, if I were in a, you know, uh, I can't really do this effectively, but I'd say a show of hands around how many times you've been told that there's a freeze on and you can't make a change to a system, even though you really want to, and you've identified a vulnerability that really needs to be remediated, but there's a change freeze and, and you have to kind of hold until maybe the end of the retail season or, or in the financial sector, there's, you know, if you're doing card processing, there's that time at the end of the year, or it's usually around November, December timeframe. Um, if there are competing priorities or if a system is maybe too fragile, I have a, a bullet there that says the untouchable systems, the ones that seem to always get away with not having to follow the rules because they're so important, because they're so critical to the organization. You can't really mess with them. You can't really touch them or, 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 or even look at them the wrong way, if you will. Um, there is this kind of concept of availability being, you know, you, you've heard the confident, the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are systems where availability wins out over the other two. Even though they represent real risk, the lack of availability in case you applied a patch and it took it down the, the lack of availability somehow wins out over the confidentiality and integrity of those systems. And it makes sense. Availability is a legitimate a leg on the three-legged stool of the CIA triad. That makes sense. We just don't think about it that much. But it does, it does make sense. And we get angry about this sometimes or frustrated about the, 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 the lack of ability to influence these systems. But we have to, at the end of the day, figure look, the business is, is measuring risk and the, and the risk of one of those things is greater than the other two. Um, so how do we do that? And those legacy systems, of course, that um, sometimes this is, this is actually not a very good excuse, but we hear that, um, oh, don't bother patching that system because it's going away. Again, I would ask for a show of hands, but this is, a, lot of, a lot of us have heard that one. Um, and, and those systems year after year are quote unquote, going away next time uh, we come back around. Um, that's, that's oftentimes kind of a, kind of a mulligan <laughs> that you, that you want to, you want to kind of push past that one a little bit, but these are all these constraints, right? That we need to work through. Um, there is the patch that doesn't patch. Um, you wait, you're patient, you wait until that change window. Um, you've got your patch lined up. Uh, maybe it's very hard to apply it without the proper technology. And we'll talk a little bit about how VMDR helps with this, but you push the patch out, it, it applies, you go home, maybe it's a late night. Usually the change windows are like two in the morning on a weekend. It's terrible timing for a lot of people. Um, and then Monday comes around, you rescan the system and guess what? It's still vulnerable. How did that happen? Um, there are a lot of patches that just, they require multiple steps or when they patch, maybe they don't quite tell you they patched correctly or they don't show it if you're doing what's called unauthenticated scanning um, and you don't have something that's there that can really look at in the Windows system to be the registry or, or in Linux, maybe it's a local agent that's able to, to, to look at the actual patches that are applied. It's just you know from the outside looking in. Sometimes uh, there isn't a good indicator that the patch actually was applied. And um, we need to keep in mind that that's, that's something that happens. And it's so frustrating because then you have to wait for another change window. If the, if the patch was sort of half done, um, a common one is uh, MS-17010. If, you, if you're in the space and that you hear that, it rings a bell. There's a, for the Microsoft patch, there's a patch you have to apply. Um, uh, yeah, you have to install and then you have to go make a registry change, right? And a lot of times that second one is not done and you have to wait to the next scan window. So these are, these are things that happen where remediation is such a challenge and another, another one of those that we run into. Um, this is kind of a dreaded topic, especially in this context of, uh, of, of, of uh, scanners, but it's not always the scanner's fault, right? Just to be a little bit of an apologist at the moment, um, for vulnerability scanning, I used to write vulnerability scan signatures myself. I know this, this, this problem very well. Um, there's a certain leap you need to take when you're writing uh, a vulnerability uh, signature, uh, scanning signature, where you see certain things that are there and it makes it look like something else potentially is vulnerable. This is especially true for the unauthenticated scans where, again, you're just kind of scanning the surface to try to understand and guess at and look for patterns. What's you know, what's going on beneath the hood. The, the answer to this, the, the, the best thing that 
that the Qualys engineers, I'm sure, would advocate is either authenticated scanning or uh, uh, doing doing the using the agent. So you get really good data. But if you're if you have unauthenticated scanning and you're trying to guess at it. You, you might sometimes are going to say you might have these things and those things those things are known to be vulnerable so um, the 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 positive findings without the attack surface that's that's always been a problem and and false positives aren't just the scanner sometimes sometimes false positives can come from um, some use or some suspected use of a, of a library or something that's there that maybe doesn't really have any attack surface something that exists within the environment that is um, that is not being used, that is not being exposed in any way, even if it exists. This happens quite a bit in IoT, uh, where you have device images, pieces, you know, firmware that has an older version of a Linux kernel or something on it that has a lot of vulnerabilities, but your ability to get to that vulnerability as an attacker is very, very limited. Um, so that's that's another area where false positives sometimes it's really more of a true positive, but perhaps it doesn't really re it doesn't really represent risk. Um, there are also, of course, those systems within the environment all of us deal with that when you report something as being vulnerable, it's like, of course, that's vulnerable. We're, we're using that within maybe a developer environment or something like that. So uh, these are all things that maybe they don't maybe they don't get off that easy maybe that's an environment where you're like you know we really shouldn't have systems exposed like that but these are you know these are all kind of within that that realm of things that we get pushed back on or or areas where um uh the the environment really isn't what it seems from a scanner perspective you know uh, whether or not that's that's pushback or or just proving it out by looking at it closer uh, Third-party devices are a big one, um, uh, as I've, I've mentioned this a few times, and this is really the up-and-coming area for vulnerability scanning. And you know, as a CISO, um, looking at now doing uh, IoT scanning in addition to uh, vulnerability uh, traditional IT scanning within the vulnerability environment. And 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 the biggest problem, and this hasn't this isn't new because we've always had devices like this. We've always had load balancers that are running Linux. Um, or some other, you know, something that exists in the environment that the scanner will tell us there's a vulnerability here, and we don't have ourselves any ability to really fix that. Um, we also run into this heavily with uh, end of life devices, operating systems that, or, or or operating systems where something is running on a device, and we we just can't do anything about it. We would update it if we could, but that's a very integrated system, and to do so would be to void your warranty or to, to maybe potentially destroy the device's ability to work. Um, so so there is a there is a big kind of contextual piece to this and applicability. And um, I, I threw Ripple 20 and Urgent 11 in there because those have gotten headlines recently in terms of IoT vulnerabilities. And those are very much uh, situational. Uh, there's, there's a lot to that. There's a lot we could, we could discuss about those vulnerabilities, but they essentially have um, very you know, specific things that have to happen but uh, in order to, to, to really utilize those vulnerabilities and you have to have a specific type of goal as an attacker uh, within there. So a lot, of, a lot of things that depend on the situation uh, within there. And, and, and these are, you know, this is that third party device kind of problem that we need to live with and learn how to navigate from a remediation perspective. Um, this, this one is, is, is actually kind of comical, but very true. Um, it, it, it's actually, the probably you know the thing we spend the most time on at X Force Red when we run vulnerability management programs for our clients is finding the thing. Um, you have a vulnerability that shows up on a device and and uh, or an application, and um, you don't know where it lives. You don't know who owns it. It's not in the inventory. It's or it's not clear or it's 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 look it's uh, attached to uh, some a personnel record. Maybe somebody that doesn't work here anymore. Um, you shouldn't patch those without authorization. Of course, I put those ellipses there because sometimes it's very tempting. Really, if you have the ability to push a button and patch it, um, like if you have VMD, uh, VMDR set up in such a way where you can do that, uh, it's tempting to push that button. I'd encourage you not to do that until you find out where it is because, of course, if, it, if the patch does fail in some way or causes some problem, you know, that's, that's where you kind of wish uh, you hadn't done it. Um, but these can be abandoned systems. They can be gaps in the in the inventory CMDB. They can be 
um, just systems that have been stood up maybe uh, in, a, in, in a way that is inappropriate. Um, we have found a number of devices that have been stood up in, in environments that belong to, to, to teams that probably didn't have authorization to do that, but they were moving in kind of an agile fashion and, and, and installing these systems. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that is just kind of problematic, right? So, so, so looking around, doing the research. And so these are the realities, right? And um, I'll get to here in a minute why we think VMDR is very powerful in this space. The reality is here, it takes a lot of time and we have to be able to manage a lot of different projects. When we do vulnerability management programs for our clients, we, we, we look at it in terms of keeping plates spinning, a lot of different research projects and being able to very effectively multitask between different threads. Um, you, sometimes you have to put a bookmark in it, come back to it. Um, if you can be opportunistic, I like this, um, this phrase spring loading thing, spring loading tasks based on dates or events, something that's going to jump back. Maybe if we're pushing to the end of that change freeze, set that spring loaded task to jump back in your face right after the change freeze, you know, welcome back. Let's fix these things right uh, at the end of an event. And when um, there's uh, there's a, there's this concept of low hanging fruit patches that you could easily fix, push to fix multiple vulnerabilities, be opportunistic, kind of be the advocate for remediation uh, throughout the engagement, and then make it as easy as you can on the people who are managing those systems, as much as you can make that simple for them to choose the right thing and not push back. That's the best way to do it. Um, we know that good remediation takes research, um, finding the owners, um, using that data from discovery scans to really, you know, get clues about where it is, who it belongs to, and and making sure that remediation during that change window is effective, making sure you're pushing on that. Um, and of course, the more data that we have, the better. So that's where I get into more of the VMDR side, that correlation. One of the key features of VMDR is that it, it correlates very closely the, the vulnerability with the patch to say these two things are related rather than you know the vulnerability and then you have to go find the patch, which you spend time doing. The VMDR, the key to VMDR is it'll tightly couple those things so you can see exactly which patches you need to apply. Um, and there's actually a piece that doesn't get talked about, I think, enough with this new capability of VMDR, but it's um, on the detection side, there is a passive scanning capability that allows us to find things we normally wouldn't find with scanning. If the device is completely um, hidden, and there's no obviously no agent on it, and there's no authenticated capability for authenticated scanning, and the, and the device just shows up and starts beaconing and doing things, we're going to see that with the, with the passive scan, and we're going to get more information about what it talks to. So that whole paradigm has shifted a bit. If I can get passive data to see what the device is talking to, I have a bunch of other tools to use in terms of my research and finding that device and doing something about it. And of course, the threat feeds the, the weaponization capability that X-Force Red brings and that Qualys brings as part of their threat protection capability. These are all things that really help us out. So more data is key. So a couple of six items here to really think about in terms of the long tail remediation management strategy. Think about, first of all, running a team, how many parking spaces your team can handle. That's the way we think of it. And so we have this kind of air traffic control cap uh, uh, metaphor here. Uh, how much, how many, how many docks, how many gates, how many planes, right, can we handle? And, and these parking spaces or these gates are, are, are kind of slots in terms of their bandwidth and how much bandwidth the team has in terms of, of uh, how fast uh, or how many things they can handle. Using that prioritization to stack rank those findings and then looking for opportunities for quick wins, making them your advocates to be opportunistic and use that data to push vulnerability remediation quicker. And then once you're doing that, finding, assigning the owners, um, and they, these would all be inside these slots, right? These, these sort of long threads annotating the records based on delays, um, using um, bookmarks, using notes, doing good job keeping notes on those long threads where maybe you're waiting for a scan uh, uh, change window, or maybe you're waiting on an IoT vendor to release a patch, but being a, you know doing a good job and looking for really from an opportunistic perspective there. They haven't talked about short-term remediation much, but in the IoT land, a lot of times we look at what can we do to, to segment, to, to, to kind of split off these devices and protect them with infrastructure? There are other short-term things you can do to limit the risk in the meantime, right? 
um, before uh, maybe a, a full patch can be done. Uh, and then and then keep going. Once you hit a point where you've bookmarked and you've got it all the way up to where it can be, that slot opens up for the next most important one, right? And and taking those notes and being and 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 being diligent to always be pushing ahead and trying to remediate these vulnerabilities as much as you can. And the end goal is, and or the end uh, statement, I guess, is that I'm that I'm saying with remediation is we really do need all the help we can get, and that's why tools like you know, the, the, what we're talking about VMDR and these capabilities, um, we're just starving for these things all the time in the, in the, in the trenches. Um, so so X-Force Red Vulnerability Management, our team, we help you to get the most out of your vulnerability management tools. We're, we're really the make use of team within this space where anything you can give us, we're going to push it, right? And, and we have very strong opinions about how these devices work and how these different solutions work. We see VMDR and just a lot of opportunity to utilize this technology to really reduce the, the highest risk vulnerabilities within the organization. We also create runbooks, processes. Um, we, we run vulnerability management programs and help drive those remediation tasks to ground. Um, some of, the, some of the, 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 the capabilities I was talking about earlier, those are the ways that that's the way we engage. Um, we have our own attacker intel. We utilize it, whatever intelligence you have in ours to really find and fix those vulnerabilities. And from the VMDR side, how that optimizes this capability is that 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 uh, feature to map those vulnerabilities directly to patches that takes out a lot of time where we're not sitting there trying to figure out well if you have this vulnerability what what patch does that correspond to? We don't have to worry about that so much. Um, that that passive scanning capability again, I think that's kind of the best kept secret. If you will, um, I, I'm sure you'll hear more about that. But from our from our perspective, as a as a um, uh, third party that's using this capability, we really see a lot of opportunity to use passive scanning to learn more as part of the research and as part of the detection capability. We we like that a lot. Um, this uh, ability to automatically launch remediation activity via the Qualys agent or third party patching solutions is huge. Um, that push button remediation is great. I'm sure you will hear a lot about that. Um, and, and when you have clearance to be able to do that patching, absolutely, that's a huge, that's a huge um, feature to be able to do that and, and, and really do that at a push of the button. And all of the data gathering, passive active, agent-based scanning, anything that makes it easier for us to learn more from the remediation management perspective, obviously, is going to help us in, when we're driving these things to ground. So I really appreciate your time. I'm very excited about VMDR. Um, I, would, I would like to encourage you to look us up utilize our, our capabilities within IBM X-Force Red to help drive your vulnerability management program with tech, technology um, like VMDR, which makes it you know, very easy for us to, to, to perform that activity for you and, and work together to build out your, your capabilities. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today and uh, have a great rest of your time at uh, QSC and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.